Uh, kia ora tato, na mihi nui, kia koutou, uh, and thank you, thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Um, so, as the title suggests, this paper considers the role of fiscal policy in New Zealand's uh, macroeconomic stabilisation. It analyses some of the issues uh, touched on in the Secretary's speech. Uh, it's an overview paper that takes stock of what we know and seeks to identify research priorities, and it's part of a broader work programme on macroeconomic frameworks at the Treasury. Um, as been mentioned, there's a draft working paper um, that sits behind this presentation, uh, very much a work in progress, um, and we welcome feedback on that draft working paper, um, and it will be on the Treasury website, so also feel free to send written comments to me by, by email, um, as well as providing comments after this presentation. Um, and I should just say the paper you know, represents the views of the authors, um, so it shouldn't be attributed to the Treasury or the government. Uh, as a roadmap for this presentation, we'll, we'll motivate the topic, discuss the contribution of fiscal policy to macroeconomic stabilisation, then discuss the automatic stabilisers, discretionary policy and, and semi-automatic stabilisers. Uh, so fiscal policy refers to the government's management of the public finances, and it's useful to consider fiscal policy along three dimensions, sustainability, structure and stabilisation. Uh, which is sort of a framework that's been used at the Treasury for, for some time. Um, although these dimensions are interdependent and, and can't be you know, fully separated in analysis, um, and fiscal and monetary frameworks need to be considered together um, because fiscal and monetary operations are consolidated in the government's balance sheet and into temporal budget constraints. And ultimately the whole framework needs to be evaluated with regard to the outcome of improving society's well-being. So we'll start with the consensus assignment. Um, so this is the principle that monetary policy should be responsible for inflation control and cyclical stabilisation, uh, whereas fiscal policy should be responsible for debt sustainability. The consensus assignment became popular amongst macro, uh, academic macroeconomists and policy makers, and essentially New Zealand's macroeconomic institutions are based on, on this principle. The consensus assignment found support in New Keynesian macroeconomic theory, which used sticky price models with social welfare derived from consumers' utility. In these models, it's generally optimal for the central bank to vary the nominal interest rate in response to aggregate demand shocks to ensure the right real interest rate, since prices adjust slowly. Fiscal policy is a less efficient tool, since it would entail temporary movements in the size and structure of government away from its socially optimal level. But there are two significant caveats to these results, and these were always known. It assumes that monetary policy is unconstrained in the sense that the interest rate could be moved up and down. The effect of lower bound is a relevant example of a constraint, uh, but other examples would be currency unions or fixed exchange rate regimes, or situations where the financial system is impaired in some way, um, impacting on monetary transmission. Um, and a further caveat is that fiscal policy may be more effective in offsetting particular distortions and shocks. Institutional and political economy arguments also supported the consensus assignment, and arguably they were more influential in institutional design. It was argued that monetary policy could be adjusted more quickly and frequently than fiscal policy, and a central bank with operational independence could be insulated from political processes and overcome a problem of time consistency. Conversely, discretionary fiscal policy was subject to implementation lags and political processes that made it unsuitable for cyclical management. Although proponents of this view recognised that automatic fiscal stabilisers may be helpful, or at least not harmful, in supporting macroeconomic stability. The Secretary touched on this, so internationally there's been a reappraisal of the role of fiscal policy in the last decade. Um, you know, in combination, um, you know, um, the following propositions, I think, create a case to put greater weight on, on the stabilisation role of fiscal policy. So first, the limits of monetary policy. Um, the effect of lower bound would be such a limit. And moreover, the, the risk of hitting the effect of lower bound can reduce expected inflation, making it more difficult for the central bank to achieve its mandate. Now, it could be argued that monetary constraints are, in, are institutional and therefore can be removed. After all, the lower bound exists because physical currency pays a zero interest rate. And alternative monetary tools and strategies have been proposed to make the, the lower bound less binding. The point I would make is the scope for monetary frameworks to manage stabilisation needs to be evaluated. A comparative assessment of the relative merits of changes to fiscal and monetary frameworks is needed, uh, and this paper contributes to half of that assessment. Uh, 
Second, we need to be persuaded that the welfare gains make it worth it. Recent theoretical and empirical work has improved our understanding of the links between business cycles and trend output, and this work suggests that macroeconomic shocks can have large persistent effects, known as hysteresis, and incorporating hysteresis effects may materially improve the cost-benefit calculus of countercyclical fiscal policy. And then third, we need to be convinced that fiscal policy can be effective in macroeconomic stabilisation, uh, which I'll pick up next. So macroeconomic theories make contrasting predictions about the effects uh, of fiscal policy. You know, does fiscal expansion lead to short-term expansion and output, as the standard Keynesian model would suggest? And the key concerns of this conclusion have been the Ricardian equivalence theorem, crowding out, and debt sustainability. So on the Ricardian equivalence proposition states that a debt finance tax cut will have no impact on consumption or output because consumers anticipate future tax increases. Uh, but it's not supported empirically. I mean, household saving behaviour is likely to be influenced by public saving levels, certainly, but not to the extent of full offset. And in particular, consumers react more strongly to changes in cash income than the theory suggests, and less strongly to anticipated future income. And liquidity constraints are thought to be a significant factor driving these results. Crowding out occurs when public spending shifts resources from the private sector. Its extent will depend on monetary policy constraints and accommodation and the degree of spare capacity. An estimated fiscal multipliers provide some insight and are estimated to be positive generally in the literature, implying less than full crowding out on average. Now, this is found in Ramey's 2019 survey of the literature, uh, a number of New Zealand VAR studies, um, and such as the work of my colleague Yifei Lu, who will be talking at this uh, presentation, and dynamic general equilibrium macro models such as the IMF's macro model of the New Zealand economy. Finally, there can be concern about fiscal expansion being thwarted when debt limits are reached, or the prospect leading to higher risk premia. Uh, these issues will be relevant in some circumstances, expectations matter, and multiple equilibria are possible. But New Zealand appears some distance from fiscal limits. Moreover, we need to consider fiscal feedback to debt sustainability, as countercyclical fiscal policy may actually support fiscal sustainability if it improves the economy. The evidence on the effectiveness of the automatic stabilisers comes largely from studies using a cross-section of countries. Government size is used as an indicator of the size of the automatic stabilisers that is somewhat exogenous to the cycle. The size of government is negatively correlated with output volatility in advanced economies. And while this correlation doesn't establish causality, uh, it has been found to be robust to a wide range of controlled data samples and specifications. We consider two approaches to estimating the size of the automatic stabilisers in New Zealand. Uh, a macroeconomic approach that is derived from the method for estimating the cyclically adjusted budget balance, and a microeconomic approach that uses a microsimulation model to estimate the contribution of the tax and transfer system in stabilising household income. The macroeconomic approach uses the semi-elasticity of the budget balance with respect to the output gap as the measure of the size of the automatic stabilisers. Uh, it's derived from the estimated revenue and expenditure elasticities with respect to the output gap. So the semi-elasticity measures the response of the budget balance to GDP ratio and percentage points of GDP for a one percentage point change in the output gap. In other words, it measures the proportion of an output shock that is offset by changes in the budget balance. Price, Dang and Botev estimate the budget balance seem elasticity for OECD countries using the OECD cyclically adjusted balance method and data. And New Zealand's budget balance semi elasticity is estimated to be 0.51. In other words, New Zealand's automatic stabilisers absorb around 51% of the output gap. This is close to the OECD average for, o, um, for OECD countries uh, of 0 0.5. And we find similar estimates using the Treasury cyclically adjusted balance method. A microeconomic perspective on the automatic stabilisers assesses how the tax and transfer system performs in stabilising household disposable incomes. Microsimulation models can be used to estimate the size of the automatic stabilisers at the individual household level. This approach has the advantage of isolating the causal uh, effects of the automatic stabilisers, and it complements the macro approach. 
We use the Treasury's micro-simulation model of the tax and welfare system, TAWA. The model combines data from StatsNZ's Household Economic Survey and administrative data sets using the Integrated Data Infrastructure, or IDI. And TAWA models the effect of, New Zealand, of the New Zealand tax and transfer system on household incomes. For each household, denoted H, the disposable income, DI, is defined as the sum of market income composed of wages, self-employment self income and investment income, plus any welfare benefits received and tax credits received, and an income taxes are deducted. Um, but note that corporate and consumption taxes are, are not modelled. The income stabilisation coefficient measures the share of disposable income which is absorbed following a shock to market income due to the tax and transfer system. It's a microeconomic indicator of the size of the automatic stabilisers. We consider two scenarios that reduce market income, which we denote as delta MI. The income stabilisation coefficient, or ISC, is then, can then be defined as the relative difference between the change in market and disposable income. Um, so we model two income shock scenarios so that aggregate market income is reduced by 5%. So in the first scenario, every individual has their market income reduced by 5%, so everyone's wages um, just reduced. In the second scenario, there's an increase in the number of unemployed individuals, uh, and this is modelled as a random process with a uniform distribution. The results are sensitive to modelling assumptions and the type of economic scenario considered. So this chart shows the income stabilisation coefficient, uh, ISC, estimated under the two scenarios. The ISC is averaged across all households, and then this is broken down uh, by household income quintile uh, based on their in the distribution of income prior to the shock. Uh, on the left, the market income shock scenario has an average ISC of 33%. Uh, so taxes and transfers offset around a third of the income shock. And this is fairly uniform across income quintiles. On the right, the unemployment shock has an average ISC of 42.4%. This is higher than in the other scenario, highlighting the additional stabilisation via job seeker payments. These scenarios are chosen to illustrate how the automatic stabilisers operate through different channels. In the first scenario, taxes make the largest contribution to stabilisation, while in the second scenario, benefit payments are more significant. We see that transfers are relatively more significant for the lower quintiles than higher quintiles, as expected. And there are marked differences across income quintiles in the higher unemployment scenario. As an international comparison, we find that the average ISC of 33% for the income shock is the same as the average for European Union countries in a similar study. So further evidence that New Zealand's automatic stabilisers are around the average amongst OECD and, and European countries. We note too that the ISC indicator can be related to more widely used concepts of taxation. In the first scenario, the ISC is essentially measuring an effective marginal tax rate. For example, the additional dollar of earnings, it measures how much is paid in taxes and lost through abatement of transfers. In the second scenario, the ISC is essentially measuring participation tax rates, or if you like, benefit replacement rates. It is measuring the income difference between being in work and out of work. So this indicator illustrates the type of significant trade-offs uh, between stabilisation and long-term efficiency objectives. We now turn to studying the cyclical behaviour of New Zealand fiscal policy. In line with a large literature, we will estimate a fiscal rule. A fiscal rule typically captures how the budget balance responds to the debt ratio and a measure of the economic cycle, such as the output gap. The inclusion of a debt variable is consistent with a debt sustainability objective, and the inclusion of an economic cycle variable measures the degree to which fiscal policy is pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical. We estimate uh, equations of the following form, following Olinelli and Momigliano, 2009, um, although there are a whole bunch of studies with, with, with essentially similar specifications. Uh, for the dependent variables, we, follow, uh, we use both the primary balance and the cyclically adjusted primary balance. The primary balance includes both discretionary changes and the automatic stabilisers. The cyclically adjusted primary balance removes the effect of the automatic stabilisers. Um, so on the right hand side we have a constant term, 
uh, a lag of the dependent variable, a lag of the debt ratio, and the output gap. We look at specifications with either the contemporaneous or lagged output gap. The lagged output gap is used because that may be more relevant uh, given the annual frequency of typical fiscal policy decisions. Think about an annual budget process. Uh, for the fiscal balance, we use a, the central government net lending indicator from the national accounts. This indicator is chosen because it's aligned to the relevant macroeconomic concept, uh, and the primary balance is calculated by um, deducting interest expenses. The available time series is from 2005 to 2019, which isn't you know, particularly long, um, and we'll use the Treasury's estimate of the output gap and the Treasury's main public debt indicator. Uh, and all fiscal variables are, are scaled by nominal GDP. The regression results suggest that New Zealand's fiscal policy, both discretionary policy and the automatic stabilisers, have been counter-cyclical on average over the sample period. Um, for discretionary fiscal policy, so that's using the cyclically adjusted uh, primary balance uh, as the dependent variable, the coefficient on the contemporaneous output gap is 0.9 and statistically significant. For the primary balance, which includes the effects of both discretionary policy and the automatic stabilisers, the coefficient is 1.24 and significant. So these results suggest that the cyclically adjusted primary balance increases by about 0.9% of GDP in response to a 1 percentage point increase in the output gap on average. And the primary balance would increase by 1.2% of GDP in response to a 1 percentage point increase in the output gap. The coefficients on the lagged output gaps are larger than in the specifications uh, using the contemporaneous output gaps, although estimates are less precise. And so the results show that fiscal policy also puts weight uh, on debt control. Uh, we should perhaps be cautious about interpreting these results with excessive precision. You know, the sample's relatively short. Uh, there are endogeneity issues, um, given the what, you know, potential um, fact that causality runs both ways. Um, and we could also look at other data sources or test sensitivity to real-time uh, data vintages. So, and we'll, we'll leave that to, to, to future work. Um, but the conclusion can be made that New Zealand's fiscal policy has operated in a broadly countercyclical manner in the last two decades. And this is the case in most OECD countries, as found in a range of studies, including for Taos and Meov 2012. A key question then is whether fiscal policy could or should be more effective um, at macroeconomic stabilisation. In particular, whether the existence of the effective lower bound requires a fundamental reconsideration of fiscal reaction functions, as argued, for example, by Blanchard and Summers. So common criteria for countercyclical fiscal policy is that it's timely, temporary and targeted. So one approach is to consider the particular policy options that would meet this criteria. This would include options to strengthen the automatic stabilisers or discretionary countercyclical policy, um, but there are also options that combine elements of both automatic stabilisation and discretionary tools. These uh, are fiscal policies that are activated by certain macroeconomic conditions, such as a recession. Uh, and these instruments are sometimes referred to as semi-automatic stabilisers or state-contingent non-discretionary fiscal policies. They make sense in the context of a need for a fiscal reaction function that is state contingent, given the asymmetry created by the effective lower bound on interest rates. The institutional framework needs to be considered. I mean, this is because fiscal policy playing the dominant role in cyclical stabilisation, at least in certain circumstances, would imply a regime shift. Um, there's this quote from Alsop and Vines, which perhaps sums it up by saying, a, a macro policy regime will work well if and only if it is clear which policy maker is assigned which objective, the objectives are achievable, and the private sector believes that the objectives will be achieved. So the types of issues that should be considered as part of a fiscal framework would then include the objectives, operational targets, instruments, decision-making rights, rules and discretion, coordination with monetary policy, information and advice, and the transparency and accountability dimensions. We have some discussion in our draft paper that draws on the insights from the literature on both monetary and fiscal frameworks, uh, and I won't discuss this uh, today in the interest of time, and suffice it to say that much more hard thinking is needed. Um, instead, I'll focus on, on what we know about some of the policy options. So we look at the options to strengthen the automatic stabilisers first. I'd note that further work is needed on a framework that integrates both long-term efficiency, equity, and stabilisation objectives. 
The Mackay and Rice attempt to develop a tractable analytical method that may lead to useful insights about the optimal design of automatic stabilizers, just as similar frameworks have yielded fruitful insights in the field of optimal taxation and optimal social insurance. So we should be monitoring this literature uh, as it develops. There are a range of channels that may be important to stabilise output, such as the disposable income channel, incentives, redistribution and social insurance, and these require a fully specified macro model to tease out. Uh, but we shall provide illustrative estimates using the budget balance semi-elasticity, the macro method discussed earlier, and this method captures only the income channel, which is a limitation, but it provides a quantitative indication of the materiality of potential policy changes as a starting point for analysis. So personal income taxation is a key element of automatic stabilisation. In principle, greater progressivity of the personal income tax system can increase automatic stabilisation. But clearly there are significant considerations for efficiency and equity. And it's likely that stabilisation benefits, uh, unlikely I should say, that the stabilisation benefits would dominate such considerations in setting the permanent tax structure. We model the impact of a recent change to tax progressivity to illustrate the potential impact on the automatic stabilisers. So this year a new top marginal tax rate was introduced. This change was motivated by revenue and distributional considerations rather than anything to do with macro stabilisation. And the impact on the automatic stabilisers is very small. The budget balance would absorb an additional 0.2 percentage points of the output gap. This is unsurprising since it affects a small part of the income distribution, but it highlights that large changes in the tax structure would be required to make a material difference to automatic stabilisation. Some welfare benefits provide timely and temporary stabilisation where their payments are linked to unemployment and or income. And in principle, welfare payments could be made more stabilising by increasing their size or their sensitivity to the economic cycle. However, again, clearly the design of a welfare system will largely depend on social preferences for redistribution and efficiency considerations. To illustrate the potential impact of changes in the welfare system, we model an illustrative 50% increase in job seeker support expenditure. This is a, a purely illustrative scenario, and for modelling purposes, we'll assume that additional expenditure is financed from additional tax revenues with the same composition as the current revenue structure. The result, this results in a moderate increase in automatic stabilisation. The budget balance would absorb an additional two percentage points of the output gap. We know that the size of government revenue and expenditure is a determinant of automatic stabilisers. There is a wide variation of, in size of government across the OECD. This chart showing uh, government consumption expenditure across OECD countries varying from 11% of GDP in Switzerland to 25% of GDP in Sweden. So it illustrates the sort of choices that societies face. If, government, if the size of government was increased by one percentage point of GDP, holding the composition of revenue and expenditure constant, New Zealand's budget balance semi-elasticity would increase by one percentage point. So there, so there would need to be a large change in government size to have a significant impact on automatic stabilisation. So an advantage of discretionary or semi-automatic policies is that they can be calibrated to the size and nature of shocks. There are institutional differences between discretionary and semi-automatic policies in terms of the degree of discretion, but the potential set of fiscal instruments is largely common. So we discussed some potential instruments that could be deployed as discretionary policies or potentially triggered by a rule. An option for fiscal support would be to use the tax and transfer system to increase the disposable incomes of households. This could be delivered in a range of ways, as a temporary tax cut, lump sum payments, or welfare payments. This would provide stimulus to the extent that households increase their consumption spending. These options have the advantage that they can be designed to be temporary. Their timeliness depends on administrative constraints. The form of a payment matters for the household spending response. Lump sum payments have been found to have a greater stimulatory impact than increasing incomes through gradual regular payments. While New Zealand has not implemented uh, lump sum payments as a fiscal stimulus policy, uh, there are international examples of implementation such as in the United States and Australia. The international evidence suggests that a proportion of lump sum payments are spent on consumption quickly by households. 
the marginal propensities to consume out of lump sum payments are generally found to be around 30 to 60 per cent uh, as a central estimate. Uh, this literature is discussed in, in our uh, draft working paper. Another form of fiscal stimulus that could be considered in the future would be a temporary reduction in the G, uh, GST rate. This could stimulate household consumption through both income and substitution effects, incentivising households to bring forward their uh, consumption expenditure in a similar, uh, in a similar way that um, lower interest rates do. Um, but temporary consumption tax rate cuts um, were implemented as stimulus measures in the UK during the GFC uh, and in a few countries um, in response to the COVID-19 shock. Changes to the conventional interest rate tool would generally be superior to a variable GST rate instrument. However, if monetary policy is constrained, a temporary GST rate cut may be an effective way uh, to stimulate consumption spending. It would be critical that changes were credibly temporary, both for the effectiveness and stimulating behavioural responses, and to ensure revenue sustainability. There is some empirical evidence that fine spending responses in anticipation of future consumption tax rates increase, um, although the magnitudes differ uh, across studies. Implementation feasibility and compliance costs need to be considered. Um, a delay between announcement and implementation would have a counterproductive effect by encouraging consumers to delay purchases. The GST rate was increased in 2010 with a lead-in period of around four months, although international examples suggest shorter periods uh, may be possible. A range of business-facing policies could also be considered. Uh, the New Zealand wage subsidy scheme stands out for its timeliness and size, and wage subsidies may be particularly suited uh, to circumstances where there is a temporary supply disruption, such as, such as in a, a natural disaster or pandemic. We could also consider policies that work through other channels, such as investment and hiring. For example, temporary bonus depreciation policies in the United States induced significant responses in plant and machine, machinery investment, according to Zwick and Mann 2017. The types of policies there could be either accelerated depreciation, investment tax credits, or partial or full expensing. Further research on the effects of such policies and how they compare to other potential instruments would be valuable. Uh, COVID-19 throws up an opportunity for researchers to evaluate a whole range of interventions, um, both you know, domestically but also internationally, and there are already interesting US studies that use rich microdata sets to do this um, in terms of the US Paycheck Protection Program. Discretionary changes in government purchases, either consumption um, or investment, uh, could be considered. Uh, however, these are subject to greater challenges than taxes and transfers and being timely and temporary. On infrastructure, um, studies have incorporated implementation delays, uh, such as time to spend and time to build into macro models, uh, starting with Leaper, Walker and Yang, and, found, and other studies have also found that these can greatly diminish the short-run fiscal multipliers. Consumption spending is usually not temporary or easily reversible, and therefore generally not a suitable candidate for stimulus. So I'll wrap up now. To sum up, there is a need to reassess the role of fiscal policy. Fiscal rules may need to become more contingent on macroeconomic conditions and monetary policy constraints. There are options to strengthen the all act stabilisers, However, large changes would be needed to make a significant difference to macro stability. Development of a set of tax and transfer instruments has the potential to support macroeconomic stabilisation. They can be calibrated to the size and nature of shocks. There remain significant challenges to effectively operating countercyclical fiscal policy, trade-offs of long-term efficiency and equity objectives, administrative feasibility, political economy constraints, and maintaining debt sustainability. This work underlines the need for further research developing the evidence base on a range of potential instruments, including the administrative capacity to implement stabilisation policy effectively 
Consideration of fiscal frameworks to balance stabilisation and debt sustainability objectives and consideration of state dependent fiscal reaction functions. And finally, consideration of the respective roles of fiscal and monetary policy, noting that this work would be complemented by work looking at options to remove constraints uh, on monetary policy. Uh, thank you, and um, yeah, happy to take comments uh, and questions. Cheers, it's Les Oxley from the University of Waikato. Uh, thanks, Oscar, for your presentation. Um, I, I was waiting to hear what has changed post-COVID. Um, much of what you were talking about here reminds me of my undergraduate degree. Uh, many of you might put two and two together and suggest um, that was a long time ago. Um, and I was waiting to see what is fundamentally different. Um, and perhaps I missed it. Um, secondly, Quite a lot of the evidence on helicopter money, particularly from the US, is that a significant amount of that ended up in the crypto markets, um, where a lot of millennials and Gen Z took this as a freebie. Um, work that we've been doing in the experimental lab at Waikato suggests that there's a similar sort of response to an unexpected uh, windfall. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily a lot of evidence suggesting it's a a sensible policy to follow. But more seriously, you know, if I was looking for three or four takeaways to take with me for my first year macro class, you know, what would I be saying about fiscal policy post COVID? Cool, thanks for the question, Les. Um, so I think, I mean, I didn't focus so much on, I guess, the structural trends and challenges in this presentation, but it's a critical part of, of the overall work program. Um, I mean, I think some of the structural trends are not necessarily just about COVID, right? They're partly about what we've been observing post GFC. Uh, the falling neutral interest rate, I would suggest, would be a pretty fundamental uh, challenge to existing macro frameworks. Um, but there are also other uh, issues that, um, or structural relationships, I guess, in the macro economy that people are focusing on. Um, you know, where exactly is Nairo and the degree of spare capacity, the flattening of the Phillips curve, um, the you know inflation dynamics and why inflation has been been so subdued um, after COVID, uh, after the the GFC. There's the literature on uh, hysteresis and the idea of trend and cycle. Now, some of that may uh, be in your um, you know undergraduate uh, teaching, um, Les. I mean, so there's an element perhaps of of rediscovery of uh, certain policy instruments, I'd acknowledge that. Um, but I think, you know, relative to where the framework was set, I guess in the 1980s, I'd say there have been some pretty fundamental things that have shifted in the, in the macro economy. Um, in terms of, you know, helicopter spending, um, I mean, I guess you've, you've given us an anecdote about um, crypto. I mean, I think the best studies that have looked at what has been the spending response of households um, in receipt of, of lump sum payments does suggest marginal propensities to consume in the order of 30 to 60 per cent. So this literature is, is referenced in, in, in our paper. I, I didn't put it up on, on the slides. Um, and obviously, it would be nice to have always better, better estimates and more precise estimates. But that seems like a material enough uh, spending response to, to think that this sort of instrument uh, might well be uh, effective. And I guess you have to compare it to the other options. You know, infrastructure spending certainly sounds attractive. It has potentially high fiscal multipliers, long-run productivity benefits, but, but seems a lot less timely uh, than uh, transfers, which is why I think we need to think seriously about tax and transfer instruments. Oh, thank you very much, Oscar, for a, um, an interesting presentation. And thank you, Carolee, also for an excellent introduction. Uh, Bob Buckle, um, Victoria University of Wellington. Um, Oscar, um, your presentation reminded me and Carolee's introduction of a conference we held in 2006 where we addressed the, ver the very same issues. And this was prior to the global financial crisis um, and the framework that was dominant at that time, you summarised quite nicely, uh, 
Um, it, it would be worth having another look, I think, at some of the issues we discussed about the merits or otherwise of strengthening fiscal policy for stabilisation purposes, such as using the tax system. Um, and the trade-offs that are involved uh, in trying to, for example, change GST uh, on a temporary basis, the trade-offs there versus the implications it might have for longer-term implications for the structure of your tax system, just as one example. Um, but my, my main comment would be uh, 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 really this question. Do you think the changes in attitudes uh, towards the role of fiscal policy versus monetary policy is influenced more by the global the, by the um, pandemic, which was a very severe shock and did show up some limitations of how um, how far monetary policy can go in supporting. It did reveal how quickly an effective instrument such as the wage subsidy can be whether or not this thinking is relevant for uh, what might be short-term severe shocks versus a longer-term role, and whether or not changing the, eff the effectiveness of monetary policy for longer-term stabilisation of the business cycle as against responses to severe shocks like this. Is there a different way of thinking about these roles? Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, really, really good comments. Um, so yeah, this this has actually been a theme um, throughout um, you know conferences like like this, as, as Bob mentions. Uh, I didn't I didn't mention it in my my talk, but just the sort of slide from my my annex, which just sort of mentions the fact that a lot of the discussion was around the stabilisation role of fiscal policy through the 90s and 2000s, I think, but a lot of the attention being focused on external imbalances and the impact of high interest and exchange rates for economic performance. Um, and so there were you know, a range of solutions. So some was about strengthening fiscal balances, being ready for the rainy day, reducing fiscal pro-cyclicality and thinking about some of the institutional dimensions. And I think that is relevant, um, as well as designating certain fiscal instruments for cyclical stabilisation, like the GST proposal. Uh, Willem Boiter was talking about it um, at the conference you, you organised. Um, I mean, I think, as you mentioned, sort of the context has changed in terms of the effect of lower bound, which I think creates a much more powerful problem definition. And we need to think seriously about those microeconomic efficiency trade-offs but perhaps the balance between those costs and benefits um, has, has shifted. Um, yeah, in regards to uh, your, your point about COVID, I mean, I think we have, we still need to build up a taxonomy of different types of shocks, right? So there's these severe types of shocks um, and crises where you might want to use particular instruments in, in a toolbox and think about particular channels. Um, and I think building up the evidence base and thinking also from first, first principles um, about that, um, you know, seems, seems quite critical. Um, and it's also the difference, I think, between the sort of automatic stabilisers, which might manage your sort of your fluctuations versus, um, but are unlikely to be sort of sufficient in, in, in really extreme shocks. Uh, Norman Gamble from Victoria University. Um, Oscar, I, maybe this is a question for later on in the day, I don't know, but uh, my question really is, one of the lessons it seems to me from COVID that we, we will need to learn is the impact of monetary financing of fiscal deficits. Um, and in particular, given explosions in asset prices in various countries, New Zealand included. Um, that seems to me an area that deserves much more examination when looking at the consequences of expanding <clears throat> public deficits during a, a large shock. Getting back to, I think Bob made an important point about the difference between what we might think of as normal stabilisation versus very substantial shocks. Uh, but I just wondered, is Treasury actively thinking about this? Does it see it as a problem that needs to be addressed? Um, or where would you see that issue going in terms of the coordination of monetary policy or indeed perhaps the, the, the non-intervention um, of um, extra monetary instruments at a time when fiscal policy is trying to deliver substantial um, improvements to outcomes? Yeah, I mean, it's quite a broad question, so I'll take part of it as a comment, I guess, around the, the nature of the work programme. I mean, I think Treasury's always thinking about coordination um, 
between fiscal and monetary policy in an appropriate way, though you know, respecting that we, we certainly don't have um, monetary financing of, of fiscal deficits. I mean, I think to link it back to this presentation in terms of the institutional framework that we need to be thinking about, um, that part of that would have to be you know, fiscal and monetary coordination. And you know, the, the academic literature talks about regimes of you know, monetary dominance or fiscal dominance. Um, and I guess that's a, a key risk uh, with this kind of um, you know, counter-cyclical fiscal policy that you, you don't get into a situation where, where debt is so high that there's fiscal dominance and that ultimately creates risks of price stability. So I would say that as a, as a risk that we need to guard against and that's partly about designing an effective uh, fiscal framework where you can operate uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy perhaps in certain circumstances um, but you're maintaining debt sustainability, which is critical to, to backing price stability. Um, I think we've got a minute left, so... Oh. Andrew? Uh, ten years ago, we had a fairly large shock in Christchurch. Do you mention that and what lessons were learned from the availability of insurance um, to ameliorate the financial aspects of that shock and take it off the government's balance sheet? Would you like to comment a bit further on uh, what you learned about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I put that in the, the basket of this sort of a range of different types of instruments and insurance approaches um, would be one, which I think you know, would be deserving of, of further thought. Um, you know, there's obviously social insurance at the individual level, which is in the context of unemployment insurance is sort of a, a topic of um, work that the government is looking at, but obviously insurance type mechanisms uh, could, could be uh, thought about more broadly. Um, I mean, I think the other lesson from the various earthquakes we had, we had Canterbury, then Kaikoura, Kaikoura then COVID, actually wage subsidy mechanisms were also used uh, in each of those cases, which I think was partly about the the nature of them being supply shocks and wanting to support business continuity and, and limit damage, um, but there's also something quite critical about administrative constraints and what, what you can actually implement ex post. I think insurance raises the prospect of designing something sort of ex ante, which, which might be, uh, you know, might, might have it, its advantages. So um, I, I think that's a good comment. Thanks. I think we've got time for one more, so Eric, very quickly. Just very quickly, if the steer that we're getting here is that Treasury is seeming a lot more comfortable with a lot more debt than previously would have been considered prudent, and I'm still terrified about kind of earthquake risk that Andrew just pointed to, has Treasury been thinking at all about the potential for uh, catastrophe bonds as one of the ways of financing uh, some of what they're currently trying to do? Because those get voided in the case where you'd really want to be able to issue a lot more debt quickly, right? So you issue a pandemic bond, you pay a little bit more on interest, but the bondholder gets wiped out if you get the big earthquake, which is exactly when we would need the capacity to handle more debt. Yeah, I'll take that as a, as a, 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 you know, as a good comment. I, I won't uh, comment on that. It's not, not my area. Um, all right. So that sort of brings us to the end of that session. Um, so first off, just thank you to Oscar for that excellent presentation. And, uh,